Welcome to the Highly Sensitive Person Podcast, a twice monthly podcast for people who experience the world intensely. Join me on a journey of acceptance of our highly sensitive person traits. Welcome to episode 61. I'm your host, Kelly. This is a podcast about what it's like to have sensory processing sensitivity, the challenges, the benefits, and personal stories. As highly sensitive people, a popular misconception for those who aren't very familiar with the trait is that HSPs are not mentally strong, that all HSPs are emotionally fragile. But you can be mentally strong and an HSP, it's just about what coping skills you have. And that's why I'm excited about today's guest, Amy Morin, who is an expert on mental strength. Amy is a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, professor, a TED Talk speaker, and published author. In 2013, her post, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, went viral and ended up being published into a best-selling book and translated into 20 languages. Her post was the most read article of all time on Forbes.com. I was moved by her story and the massive challenges she's dealt with in her life and how she's found a way to thrive and become stronger and become an authority who now helps others learn how to better cope and increase their mental strength. I'd like to welcome Amy Morin to the show. Hi, Amy. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is, how did you come up with this article about the 13 things that mentally strong people don't do? Well, I'm a therapist, and I used to just write articles occasionally on the side. And I had published this particular article to the web, and it went crazy viral. And within a matter of days, millions of people had read it, and it was crazy. I was getting calls from national news channels asking me about it, and all sorts of people were talking about it, and it was being reprinted in magazines. And Nobody knew why I wrote it, and I didn't, at the time, I didn't come forward with the story, but um, because I wasn't in a place to tell it, that list was actually a letter to myself during one of the darkest periods of my life. Um, Back in 2003 is when my therapy career had really launched, and I got my first big job, and I got married, and I bought a house, and I thought, this is great, life's looking pretty good, and I lost my mother suddenly to a brain aneurysm, and it was then that my journey with mental strength started to become personal, and I had to figure out how do I go through this grief and still come out okay. I had started seeing a lot of clients in my office who had gone through a loss maybe 20 years earlier, and they still couldn't talk about it. It was still so painful, and I said, okay, you know, I want to know how do I heal from this? How do you go through really tough times? And and then still feel like you're okay in the end. And I worked really hard on being as mentally strong as I could so that I could face those emotions head on. And it took a long time before I started to really feel better. But then on the three-year anniversary of when my mother died, it was 2006, and my 26-year-old husband died suddenly from a heart attack. And I thought, oh, now what do I do? I'm a 26-year-old widow. I don't have my mom and I'm still working as a therapist trying to help other people with their problems. How do I do this? And how do I again face this kind of grief? It was a completely different experience being a widow now than when I had lost my mom years earlier. And so again, my journey with mental strength was a completely personal one of how do I grow stronger? How do I face this? And um, still someday feel like I'm going to be okay again. And it took a long, long time. But years later, um, I was fortunate enough to find love again and got remarried and said, okay, this is sort of my fresh start in life. But um, almost as quickly as, as I had that sigh of relief, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I thought, oh, <laughs> how do I, how do I do with one more major loss in my life. And I was really in a place where I was starting to feel sorry for myself. And it was then that I sat down and I wrote the list of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do. And it was a, I was really a letter to myself because I needed that reminder of, hey, don't do these things. It's not going to be helpful. And, and I published it to the web sort of on a whim, never imagining that it would go viral or 
or that I'd have an opportunity to turn it into a book. That is an amazing story. And when I hear you tell that story of, and the loss that you went through, that I'm sure so many of us can't even imagine that kind of a loss, did you get to a point where you felt like you either had to decide to get stronger and to get through it, which is what you did, or to kind of just give up and continue to wallow in the pain and the sorrow? Yeah, you know, I'd heard a lot of stories of people who, you know, years and years later would say, well, it never gets any easier and you never get any better. And I thought, okay, I'm 26. You know, I've lost my mother and my husband and and that was an option. I could go for the rest of my life feeling like, well, the first half or the first quarter of my life was good, but the rest of it's doomed to be really bad. Or I could make the most of what I still had. And mm -hmm. there's a part of me that said, you know, I'm grateful that I had two wonderful people in my life. I wish I would have had them longer, mm -hmm. but I'm grateful that I had them when I did. And I still have the option to to live a, a good life, even though I don't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was really, a, I had to make that conscious choice to say, okay, what can I still go out and do to make my life as good as I can, despite the hand that I was dealt? Right. And I think that's a great message. I tend to wallow on things, or if I make a mistake, or if something bad happens, I just continue to think about it. Or if it's a make mistake I made, I beat myself up over it, you know, continuously on and on and on. But I think this is a good lesson to think I can get over it and move on with my life, which is productive, or I can continue to just stew about it, which gets me nowhere. So I think that's um, one of the, uh, the mentally strong tools that I could learn and add to my toolbox as well. <laughs> so when I was reading your article about being mentally strong, I couldn't help but wonder, what would you say it means to be mentally weak? Yeah, interestingly, I never use the word mentally weak because I know that we all possess mental strength to some degree. And so I try to make it really clear that we all have the choice to become mentally stronger, mm -hmm. but that we all still have some sort of mental strength. It's just a matter of how do you strengthen it. And so I tell people mental strength is about, it's a three-pronged approach. There's really three parts to it. And it's about your thoughts, and which means thinking realistically. It's not about thinking overly positive, but it's also not about thinking overly negative, but maybe to have more of a realistic yet somewhat optimistic approach to life. And the second part is about regulating your emotions so that you feel like, okay, I'm not a slave to my emotions. When I wake up in a bad mood, I don't have to be stuck in a bad mood all day. I can take some control over how I feel. And the third part is really about our behavior. And it's saying, you know, I'm in control of what I do and I can choose to be productive despite whatever circumstances I find myself in. So, of course, some of us are better at doing those three three things than others. And there's always room for improvement no matter how how good you are, but it's important to remember that you possess certain strengths to at least some degree. Of the 13 things in your list, do you find that there's one that is the biggest sticking point for most people that's the most difficult for people to, to thrive in? I mean, it's always interesting because when people read the list or they read my book, it's, um, they'll say, oh, the one that's really the most difficult for me, and then they'll tell me, and it's I get at least some people that will give me all 13 things. Somebody will say it's number seven or somebody else will say it's number two. And it um, seems like everybody seems to have some sort of a Achilles heel. But if I had to pick the one I hear the most, it would be number two, that mentally strong people don't give away their power. Okay. What does that and mean? What, what that one, yeah, what that one really means is that you don't allow other people to be in control of how you think, feel, or behave. So, for example, sometimes people will say, well, my boss makes me feel so bad about myself or my mother-in-law makes me feel bad or other people will say, you know, well, I have to I have to work late every day because my boss makes me. And it's really about saying, no, I'm in control of how I think, feel and behave. And even though there might be consequences, say, if you don't work late or maybe your boss isn't the most supportive person in the world, you still have choices over how you respond to your boss. And sometimes just changing your language and recognizing, okay, I don't have to work late. Maybe I'll get fired if I don't, but I'm choosing to do it. And that can just kind of help change your mindset so you remember, okay, I'm in control of how I spend my time and who I spend it with. And that's something, again, I've been working on as well lately is we're in charge of our emotions. Our emotions are not in charge of us. And in the world, there's so little we can control 
but we can control how we react to things. So that's something yeah. even just in the past few weeks I've been uh, <laughs> trying to put in place more in my life. And it's actually been really helpful, but it's difficult when your whole life you think that your thoughts are valid and that they're important, but sometimes they're not. They're um, like they say, they're just like uh, clouds in the sky that are weather that's passing by. Yeah. And I'll, I find it interesting with that one. And sometimes I'll speak to um you know, these big top executives at a company and these people that, you know, look like they have this incredible power. They might be in charge of hundreds of people and they'll come up to me afterwards and say, ah, I tend to give away my power. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting to hear the people that, you know, it has nothing to do with you know, what you have for a job or how powerful you might look on the outside. It's really about what happens on the inside. So it's yeah. interesting to see that so many people experience this from all walks of life. Yeah, that's fascinating. So if you find that you have one of these 13 items on the list and they're kind of like a bad habit that's ingrained in you and you've been doing it forever, how can you change so and get rid of that bad habit? Well, of course, the first thing is to recognize that you have it. And I can't tell you how many people will say, well, no, I'm not a people pleaser or no, I don't really shy away from change. But then when they really look at it, they're all, well, maybe I do. Because sometimes we manage our anxiety or we manage our uncomfortable emotions by not doing something. So you Mm -hmm. think, well, no, I'm never nervous about change. So maybe you've lived in the same house and had the same job for 20 years. So of course you're not that nervous about change if you've never done anything different. And so sometimes it's just a matter of just realizing, oh, okay, these are some of the things that I do. And then to come up with a plan, how are you going to change it? Just simply, you know, reading my book isn't going to change change your life or Mm -hmm. saying, okay, that's a bad habit. I won't do it anymore. You actually then have to follow through. So to come up with a plan and to remember that, you know, progress doesn't always come in a straight line. Sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back and to plan for that, to know, okay, if I'm going to give up something I've been doing for maybe all my life, it's not going to just, I'm not just going to get rid of that bad habit overnight. It's going to take time. Mm -hmm. How am I going to monitor my progress? How am I going to really say, what can I do today? And just like if you wanted to become more healthy physically, you're not going to say, hey, I'm going to lose 100 pounds and a week later you're going to meet your goal. It takes time and you'd really want to focus on what's one thing I could do today to become healthier. And it's really about that, breaking it down into smaller, more manageable steps Mm -hmm. and then being prepared for the days that you're going to revert to your old ways. But to know that that doesn't mean you're all the way back at square one, just because you maybe cheated on your diet one day doesn't mean you're a hopeless cause, but to say, okay, I made a mistake. Now, how do I move forward so that I don't make that mistake again? So I have a lot of people who contact me and send me emails about difficulties they're having and struggles in their life. And so often I'll recommend people that maybe, you know, hey, maybe you should talk to a therapist. It can help so many people in so many ways. And I think, you know, some people, they don't want to, or they're just don't know what to expect. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit um, for people who are thinking about it for the first time or maybe nervous about seeing a psychotherapist, just for someone who's maybe thinking about going to therapy, but they're nervous about it. How do you think that could help someone? Oh, I'm really glad that you asked that question because I'll have a lot of people that will say, you know, oh, I thought if you went to therapy, you had to go for life or that there's a lot of misconceptions. What do we do? How do you know about therapy? Usually it's what you see on TV or in the movies, which is usually an accurate, you know, you don't really have to go in and lay down on the therapist's couch and tell them all about your childhood, (laughs) you know, problems and how your parents messed you up or anything like that. But, and there are different kinds of therapists. And so I always encourage people to spend some time learning about it if you can and to know, okay, well, what, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is one type of therapy, but other therapists use a slightly different approach. So if you're interested and it would be helpful to learn about it, but on the other hand, don't feel like you have to do hours and hours of research, but instead to say, Sometimes it's okay to just call somebody, look look up a phone number of a therapist and just go ahead and call them and set up an appointment, which usually the worst part is going to that very first appointment, getting yep. through the door. <laughs> and because you don't know what to expect and you're meeting a stranger and you're supposed to, you don't know what questions they're going to ask. But to know that usually in the beginning, there are going to be questions, but you're in control. If they ask you things you don't want to talk about, you can say, I don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. But also you get to interview the therapist and say, how are, how are you going to help me? Or what sorts of techniques would you use? Or what do you recommend? And sometimes it's a matter of just three or four therapy sessions. Somebody can help you just stay on the right path. Sometimes we just need a, some reassurance that we're already doing the right thing. Sometimes it's um, just about having somebody cheer you on a little bit and you think, okay, I can do this. And um, that can in itself can be really helpful. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, therapy can help with lots of things. I think sometimes people think you um, have to have this major problem to go to therapy. And that's right. the way that it used to be, that if you had some you know, serious mental illness, then therapy might be helpful. But we've really moved away from that because we've now figured out plenty of us have problems in life. And even if you're just going through a rough patch, whether you're going through a divorce or you're having some problems with your kids or you're just kind of lost. Like, should I take this new job or not? Having somebody to process that with can be really helpful and it can prevent problems down the road. We know that opening up and talking to people can help prevent depression and anxiety and lots of other issues too. And so it can help with, you know, lots of things. And sometimes people will say, well, how do I, why should I go to therapy? I have friends, but really talking to a therapist is different. Your friends don't have the same skill set, and they're not objective either. That when you go and you talk to a therapist, they come with a a different set of tools and skills and can offer you some words of wisdom that can teach you to be your own therapist. That's our ultimate goal is to teach you the skills that you need so eventually you won't need to come to therapy. And so even if you go for a few therapy sessions now to help you deal with a certain issue, you might pick up some tools that you can use to apply to other areas of your life down the road too. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's been my experience as well. Even You don't have to go a ton of times, even just a couple of times might be enough to exactly what you just said, give you some tools to help you deal with what you're going through. And um, so many people, I feel like everyone I talk to nowadays is dealing with anxiety. I don't know if it's like an epidemic or maybe people are just more open about it nowadays, but everyone seems to be struggling with well, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people seem to be struggling with anxiety. And that's another great thing that therapists can help you with and just tell you some different ways to look at things and um, to frame your thoughts so uh, you don't let that anxiety grip oh, such a tight hold on you. Yeah, anxiety is the most treatable condition that there is. But the statistics are something like it usually takes people something like seven years after oh. they've been experiencing anxiety to go to therapy. Oh. And it's unfortunate that some people suffer that long because if the sooner you go, the easier it is to treat and you can prevent a whole bunch of things from, from getting worse when you go. But even if it has been a long time, if you've suffered from anxiety for 20 years, it's not too late. You can definitely go now and see if you can get some help to keep that anxiety at bay. Yeah. So that's my PSA. And maybe Amy, <laughs> Amy and my PSA is if yes. you're struggling with anxiety, please try to, if you can see a therapist, even if it's just a couple of times, you might be surprised how it might help you um, feel a little bit better. So since you are a psychotherapist, I wanted to ask you what you thought about highly sensitive people. Now, one thing I found, and I'm not a therapist, and I'm not a trained mental health professional, but in my um, dealings with HSPs, I found that a lot of HSPs say that they their therapists have never heard of highly sensitive people, or they just don't seem to talk about it very much. So I was wondering, from your perspective as an insider in this world of a uh, you know trained mental health professional, what do people like you think of the trait of high sensitivity? Good question. Um, most of us were trained in in the medical model, so we know about mental illnesses that most of our education, our training focuses on clinical depression, social anxiety, personality disorders, um, all of those sorts of things. Well, we know that highly sensitive people don't necessarily fall in the diagnostic and statistical manual. That's not a a diagnosis that we give out. And so because of that, I think that um, a lot of people in the in the helping professions are like, what? And don't even know what it is, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> are just like, what, what do you mean? And um, of course, because we live in the day of the internet, we have tons and tons of people that come in and tell us what they have because they've read about it online. Right. So whether somebody says, oh, I have bipolar because I am in a bad mood in the morning and by the evening I'm happy, so that must mean I have bipolar disorder or mm-hmm. something like that. And I think when it comes to something like people saying, okay, I'm a highly sensitive person, um, Sometimes people are like, well, what does that really mean? Or what article did you read that told you about that? Because it's not necessarily in the the medical literature. So Mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think sometimes there's kickback about like, well, what do you mean? And and I've had clients who say, you know, I felt like I had to educate therapists on Mm -hmm. what's going on with me. Um, And that's difficult to do. But, uh, you know, I think that it's a matter of just figuring out, well, where did you get your knowledge? And sometimes it can be helpful even to share an article with your therapist to say, hey, I read this article and it sounds a lot like me. Maybe you could read it or you could check it out or we could talk about it in my in my therapy session because we know that people definitely are much more sensitive. And I think one of the things that's happening too is that kids, we're starting to learn more about kids who tend to be more highly sensitive and we're learning that, okay, when it comes to parenting these kids, 
you need to parent them a little bit differently than you do other kids. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I'm hopeful that that's opening more doors as we start to then educate parents and talk about how do you help your child reach his full potential when he is a highly sensitive kid, then okay, well then, you know, and it's okay. You don't necessarily have to change him. You just have to know how do you help him be at his best given that he has these qualities. And I think that that's opening more doors so that more people are learning about it and thinking about it. And as an adult too, to say, okay, if this is what's going on with me, how do I find out, you know, what career path is best for me or what relationships are going to look like given my circumstances? Ah, that's awesome. So I wanted to go back to your list and I'm looking at number seven on your list. It is dwelling on the past. So something that mentally strong people don't do is they don't dwell on the past. And I think this is something I struggle with. How do you stop dwelling on the past? That's one that, you know, there's lots of different ways that we dwell on the past. And you know, I share a story in my book about after my husband, husband passed away, it was a matter of figuring out, you know, how do I allow myself to move forward? I had this irrational fear that somehow if I made these new memories and had more fun in life that... I'd forget all the fun that I ever had with him, something along those lines. And um, part of that was because after my, shortly after my mother passed away, my father's house had caught on fire and almost all of her possessions were ruined either from smoke or water damage. And, and that made it even more difficult. And we had to get rid of a lot of her stuff right away. It was about two weeks after she passed away. So then after my husband died, I thought, oh, how do I balance? (laughs) You know, I didn't want to get rid of all of this stuff. But at the same time, how do I, you know, not keep my house looking like a shrine to him? And it was a matter of figuring out how do you find that balance? I don't dwell on the past, but I also don't, you know, try to pretend it didn't exist. Because I've run into people that will say, you know, I I moved out of my house two days after I lost my loved one because it was too painful or I shut the door and never opened the bedroom door again or something like that. And on a smaller scale, I think that we tend to dwell in the past for lots of reasons, whether we can't forgive ourselves for some sort of a mistake that we made 10 years ago, or we can't forgive somebody else for hurting us five years ago, or even when we think about short-term things, something that you said in a meeting two weeks ago, and you're thinking, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we find ourselves thinking it over and over, and you rehash it in your mind, it's not helpful. It's, you know, beating yourself up and second guessing and all those sorts of things just keep you stuck and makes it really hard to enjoy the moment and you can't plan for the future. Yeah. So there's a few things that you can do to stop dwelling. Um, one of them is really simple. It's just a matter of saying, I'm going to change the channel. So when you find yourself stuck and you're thinking over and over and over about something to say, I'm, I'm not going to think about this anymore, but telling yourself, don't think about that really isn't effective. The more that we tell ourselves, <laughs> right. hey, don't think about that, the more we tend to think about it. So one of the tricks is then to just distract yourself. So you go for a walk or call somebody on the phone, but talk about something completely different. And just getting busy and moving your hands or moving your body can help get your mind onto something else, at least for a little while. Um, another trick that can help you just stop, we call it ruminating, Mm -hmm. is to say, okay, I'm going to set aside time to dwell on this. And it sounds counterintuitive, but it can actually be quite helpful. So you could say, okay, from 7 to 7.15, I'm going to let myself think about this topic. Hmm. And then whenever you think about it outside of those 15 minutes, just remind yourself, nope, it's not time to think about that right now. And just scheduling time to dwell or worry Mm -hmm. can actually help you not do it outside of that time. I like that. <laughs> I was already thinking like, oh, I, I need to schedule some time later for something I'm anxious about. I'll be anxious about it later r- rather than all day. What's the point of being anxious about it all day? Right. And so sometimes that can people will say, well, that's really helpful because then I can at least contain it to a certain part of the day mm-hmm. and it doesn't ruin my, my whole day or I'm able to concentrate on something else earlier in the day when I remind myself I'm going to give myself time to really think about that later. Yeah. So how about anticipatory grief? Would that kind of be a, a similar strategy? Like sometimes I, I mean, this sounds so silly. Um, I love my dog like a lot. And as most people love their dogs. And sometimes I'll talk to my husband and I'm like, I talk about, you know, someday she's going to die. And I like almost cry every time. 
<laughs> and he'll kind of laugh at me because to him, he's very different than I am. He thinks it's so insane. He's like, why on earth are you feeling upset about this now? Like, And I know he's right, but I can't help it because I love her so much. I know someday I'm going to have to go through this insane amount of sadness and pain. Do you have any advice on how to avoid that? Or would it be kind of similar to what you were just saying, like realize I'm doing it and then think about something else? Yeah, you know, anticipatory grief is a, it's an odd phenomenon, right? We do it when we know if you have a loved one who's really sick or when you know you're going to face some loss, which sadly most of us will at some point in our life. And yeah, um, but sometimes it's worse when you know it's coming because then you've read it yeah. <laughs> and you think about it and it can become consuming now. And so, um, but at the same time, so when somebody's facing a serious illness with a loved one or something along those lines, you you don't want to just pretend that you're not sad. It's okay to start grieving, but but then you want to balance that with still saying, well, this person's still here or my dog is still here. How do I enjoy the time that we have? Because right. the last thing that you want is once that person or animal is gone to then say, well, I just spent the last three years dreading the fact that they were mm. going to go and I didn't enjoy any of it. And so sometimes it's a matter of having a, a mantra that you just tell yourself. Hmm. Um, I once worked with this woman who was um, facing a loss and she said, you know, I, um, it was a, a parent that was gravely ill and she said, you know, every time I go over and I visit him, I start to tear up and cry and I don't want to do that. And so we talked about, right. well, what can you tell yourself? And so she would just remind herself, this isn't helpful. This isn't helpful. This isn't yeah. helpful. And to, to try to say, okay, how do I, you know, still engage in conversation and to try to make this the best that I can well, I still have it. And just having that um, sentence to say to herself would help her just really focus, get on track and say, I'm going to enjoy this as much as I can while I can. Right. That's good. I never thought about the mantra. And and you said something that um, I think about a lot is uh, I know at some point in my life, I'm going to face a lot of loss. I've been very fortunate to have actually, knock on wood, I haven't lost anyone in my life very close to me, but it's going to happen someday. And that's also the anticipatory grief too. It's it's such a nebulous thing. I don't know who it's going to be or when, but like someday it's mm-hmm. going to happen and it's going to hurt really, really bad. And it's the anticipation of that pain. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of us doubt how we would cope with loss. We tend yeah. to underestimate our own ability to to deal with loss and we Mm -hmm. overestimate you know how grave it's going to be and we think you know I'll never recover or I'll never be the same again or just you know my entire life's going to crumble but the truth is most of us um, find the inner strength when we need it and know okay when and when I am dealing with rough times that I can be okay Mm -hmm. and to have that confidence in yourself and to just to be able to say, well, I've gone through something rough before, even if it's not a major loss, but maybe you lost a job or you struggled in school, whatever it was to say, okay, I have some skills. I've been through some rough things before. I can get through this. And then to think, well, how would I be five or 10 years down the road? Am I still going to be probably, you know, crying and unable to get out of the bed? Probably not. You'll probably be, be feeling much better eventually. And so you just remind yourself that you are probably stronger than you think you are. Wow, that is really great. Because when I think about my anticipatory grief, I never think about, well, you know what, maybe I'll be okay. Like that thought never goes through my head. It's always, I'm not gonna be able to handle it. I'm not gonna be able, you know, all of these super extreme negative things. It's never like, well, maybe I can handle it. Or eventually I might be able to feel better. So after all that you've been through and with this amazing book that you've written that has helped so many people, are there still things on the list that you think that you struggle with? Yeah, I always try to tell people I come by this list honestly. And, you know, I think it's it's not something I just say, well, I don't do those things anymore. Of course, mm-hmm. I still do them. And I catch myself doing them for sure now. But I think that all of those things on that list are things that some of us, that probably everybody does some of them sometimes. And mm-hmm. it's easy to fall back into those bad habits on any given day when you face rough circumstances and um, or even when you just wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And to be able to say, okay, you know, this isn't helpful. It's going to rob me of mental strength. What can I do differently? But yeah, I fully acknowledge that I still do those things on that list. But I Mm -hmm. have a good reminder now of don't do that anymore. And, you know, things that I had known, I just never had written them all down. And a lot of it was the stuff that I saw my clients not do when they came in my office, people that bounced back from adversity. And I thought, wow, this person's doing great. And so I just keep those reminders in my head of, you know, people who are able to go through rough times and 
come out on the other end. Don't do these things. So I do remind my, myself regularly, Amy, mentally strong people don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so much of this is just realization too. Just realizing when you're doing one of these things seems to be the first step for so much of this. And that is, it's a small thing, but it's a crucial, essential, helpful thing. So I have a question for you. I work from home for myself. So every day I feel like I have not accomplished enough every single day. I feel like I'm always behind. I'm just not getting as, as many things done as I should, which means almost every single day I feel anxiety at the end of the day. Do you have any advice for how to not feel like you're just never enough, like you're never getting enough done? Yes, because now as somebody who works a lot from home, I can tell you that's a common thread, right, for <laughs> people who work from home. But also people that when you, you know, work for a, a busy job or even if you're a stay-at-home parent, mm -hmm. you know, I think that yeah. we create to-do lists that are 10 times longer than what we can actually accomplish. And then we're still adding to them. And so it feels like, oh, you know, I have so much I could have done or should have done. Um, so I think one of the tricks is at the end of the day, sometimes it's helpful to just create a list of what you did and to remind yourself, hey, I got these eight things done today or I got this one major project crossed off my list. That's good. Um, just as a reminder of, hey, you did get some stuff done. And then I think too, also when you look over your to-do list to be able to say, well, what are the things that I actually need to do? And to make sure that you have them, you know, in order of importance or you somehow highlight the things that you have to get done. And then to remind yourself, nothing on your list has to be done. There's consequences, but see, like I just used it, my language of what do I have to do today? And that's mm -hmm. stressful too, but what do I want to do today? What do right. I want to accomplish? Um, and, and to remind yourself that it's okay. You know, the earth will continue to rotate on its axis tomorrow if you never get past number three on your list. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the conversations you have with yourself. So to be able to say, hey, I did a good job or I was productive today. Or, and then on the days when you weren't, because we all have those days too, where you, you know, check social media one too many times or ended oh, yeah. up on a, a, you know, phone call with a friend for longer than you expected or, you know, whatever it is that you did that got you distracted. But to say, okay, well, then what can I do better tomorrow rather than waste a lot of time beating yourself up? Up or mm -hmm. calling yourself names for not accomplishing, but to know that that's okay. And what can I do to be better tomorrow? And then plan ahead. How do you plan for that so that you can be more productive? That leads me to a quote of yours that I heard in another interview you did that I thought was so great. I wrote it down. The only person you should compare yourself to is the person you were yesterday. Right? You said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I, or was it quoting someone else? And, and nope, that was me. Oh, okay. I love it. I think that... Um, especially with social media these days, there's so much pressure to say, you know, you log into Facebook and you see that your friends all went on vacation yes. and they all have happy, happy families and beautiful mm -hmm. children and lovely homes that are always neat and tidy. And you think, oh, you know, I'm a slacker. I'm a loser. <laughs> My yeah. life doesn't measure up. <laughs> or just when you read articles or you are just hearing podcasts from other people whose lives seem perfect, it's easy then to beat yourself up and think, you know, gosh, these people have it better better and um, I just don't measure up. But that way of thinking isn't helpful. In fact, we have studies that show that leads to depression. And to be able to say, okay, it doesn't matter that, you know, I'm just looking at other people's highlights reels. Nobody's really putting their real lives on Facebook. It's just what, what they want to portray, which is usually the, the very best things they have going on. And so to remind yourself that that's okay. I don't have to measure up that there's no um, use comparing myself to them. But I can just say, am I doing better today than I was yesterday or last week, last month, last year? Mm -hmm. And to just compete with yourself. And that can really make a big difference in the choices you make and how you run your life so that you stay true to your values. I love it. I'm going to say it one more time. I love it so much. The only person you should compare yourself to is the person you were yesterday. Amy, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Can you tell us where we can find you on social media? Sure. If you go to my website, Amy Moran, LCSW is in licensed clinical social worker dot com. Mm -hmm. I have links to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all my other social media accounts right on there. Great. And make sure you check out Amy's book, which is titled 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Take back your power, embrace change, face your fears, and train your brain for happiness and success. I'll have a link to her book and her website in the show notes, so check that out. Thank you again, Amy. Thanks for having me. 
Folks, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Amy Morin. You can find the show notes at highlysensitiveperson.net slash episode 61. There'll be links to Amy's book and also her e-course on mastering the three core factors of mental strength. And if you're still listening right now and you enjoy this episode and past episodes, would you say that that was worth mm, a dollar? There's an easy way to support the show if you enjoy it. Go to patreon.com slash HSP and you can pledge a monthly amount. Even $1 is extremely appreciated. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com, patreon.com slash HSP. Also, did you know that I have a book? It's called A Highly Sensitive Person's Life and it's on Amazon. Check it out. Thanks so much for listening. In the next episode, I'll be back to my solo format and talking about the benefits of being an HSP, which is a continuation of an episode I did a few weeks ago. See you then. 